as an introduction to the kinds of things we can do with multiple variables, let's go back and look at the multiple tanks problem that we had in an earlier project. So we have these three tanks connected together with outside links as well. We're going to let x1, x2, and x3 be the mass of salt in each of these three tanks. Then the rate of change of the mass of salt in, x1, in tank 1. First of all, there's a contribution from the external flow into the tank. So dimensional analysis, we'll make sure that we get this right. So that gives us kilograms per hour. And then we have what's coming out of tank 1. So that's at a rate of 5 liters per hour times the concentration in tank 1. And then we have to consider the connection from tank 2 into tank 1. So we have an increase of 2 liters per hour times the concentration in tank 2. And that's everything that's happening to the salt in tank 1. In tank 2, what contributes to the change in the salt? Well, there's some external fluid flowing in, but it has no salt. So that doesn't change the salt content at all. Then we have to subtract what's being pumped from tank 2 to tank 1. So we're losing 2 liters per hour at the concentration in tank 2. And I'm just going to stop writing down the units since they're always the same. Next we consider what tank 2 is pumping into tank 3. So that's a loss of six times the concentration in tank two. And then we consider inputs. So we have the input from tank three. So that's an increase of one liter per hour times the concentration from that tank. And then finally, we have the input from tank one so that's an increase of 5 liters per hour times the concentration there in tank 1. That's everything for tank 2. In tank 3, we have an input, but again, it has no salt in it, so it makes no contribution to the mass. There's an output of 6 liters per hour, so we lose 6 times the concentration in the tank 3. We also lose what we're pumping over to tank 2. So we lose 1 times the concentration in tank 3. And then we have an input returning from tank 2. So that gives us plus 6 times the concentration that's there. So that's a complete set now of three differential equations for the three, con for the three masses. So here they are summarized. And if we look at this, well, we can define the derivative of the vector x component-wise. And then we have a term that doesn't depend on x at all. So it's freestanding vector. And then we have a matrix times the vector x. So we could summarize the whole thing as a vector x prime is a function of t, a vector function of t, plus a square matrix A times x. Here's another example, just considering the interactions of glucose and insulin in the body. We will let g of t be the concentration of glucose in the bloodstream of a person. And I of t is the concentration of insulin in the same person.
So just as a top level view, right, the rate of change in glucose is going to have a term that's external, a forcing function, plus a term representing the variables G and I. And then insulin, in a non-diabetic person, has no external inputs. So this J of T is the external ingestion of glucose. And then these two functions represent the interactions between the two variables, or in the two substances, chemically in this case. Now, it so happens that if you're close to an equilibrium, so sort of a stable solution or stable values of G and I, then we can look back at uh, vector calculus and do a linearization or a linear approximation of a function of two variables. We can do that for both the F and the H. So we know that this is approximately true near an equilibrium state. And these constants A, B, C, and D are things that we would have to measure experimentally. But if we just go ahead with the generalities of this system, we could let x1 be the glucose and x2 be the insulin. And then we have a vector x with two components. And using this equilibrium approximation, we'd say that x prime is a matrix. So this is the first row of the matrix, ag plus bi, so that's the, the row ab. And then H gives us the second row of the matrix, C and D. All that's times X itself, plus the external forcing. So this again takes the form of a matrix times X, plus a vector valued function F. It's the same kind of problem we were looking at before, but we just have a vector unknown variable, rather than a scalar variable. Now, we do have to measure these constants experimentally, but just on principle, we know that A ought to be negative. That's the influence of glucose on the glucose concentration. So as glucose goes up, more of it is stored in the liver. B also should be negative because the presence of insulin speeds up the body's use and storage of the glucose. On the other hand, C should be positive. That's the influence of glucose on the insulin. The presence of glucose causes the release of insulin. And so that's a positive effect. And then D is the effect of the insulin concentration on itself. So with more present, it gets metabolized more quickly. 